Welcome to the Mershon Center, uh, the Mershon Center for International Security Studies. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Jennifer Siegel. I'm a professor in the history department here at Ohio State, and I'm very pleased to welcome uh, to the Ohio State University and, of course, uh, most importantly here to the Mershon Center, uh, Jocelyn Olcott uh, as part of the Center's speaker series. Uh, professor Olcott is Associate Professor of History at Duke University, a uh, scholar on the feminist history of modern Mexico and the transnational history of uh, feminism and, and feminist movements. Um, uh, her first book, Revolutionary, Revolutionary Women in Post-Revolutionary Mexico, explores questions of gender and citizenship in the 1930s in Mexico, and she has just finished. Uh, the uh, copy edits are, are sitting <laughs> sitting on her desk back in Durham waiting for her to return to the, oh, they're here with us now. Um, uh, a book on the, uh, it's a history of the 1975 UN International Women's Year Conference in Mexico City that uh, Oxford University Press will be bringing forth shortly. Uh, and it's entitled International Women's Year the greatest consciousness raising event in history, which might be the greatest title in history, I, I uh, believe. Uh, so please welcome me in, welcome me, join me in welcoming Professor Alcott here to the Mershon Center. And you can welcome me as well. So. Um, thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the Mershon Center so much for uh, uh, inviting me and, for, and to Jennifer Siegel for inviting me to speak today. Um, mm -hmm. And also many thanks to Kyle McRae and to Stephen Blaylock uh, from the Mershon Center for uh, their immense patience and assistance in working out the logistics of this visit. It's really an honor to be a part of this Mershon Center speaking series. Um, so the relationship, I'm going to jump right in there, the relationship between geopolitics and feminism, as many of you know, has been particularly fraught of late. The Feminist Majority Foundation support of attacks on the Taliban, even as the foundation opposed U.S. military invasion of Afghanistan, reiterated a feminist orientalism at the service of empire, a practice that dates back at least to the 19th century missionary efforts. Such practices have not, of course, been confined to the United States. Gayatri Spivak's famous description of the fantasy of, quote, white men saving brown women from brown men referred to the British imperial adventures in South Asia. And by now, we have several decades of feminist scholarship uh, critiquing these rescue narratives. Post-colonial scholars, such as Jackie Alexander and Chandra Talpad Mahanti, point to the so-called free market feminism that serves the objectives of capitalist neoliberalism. And scholars of US foreign policy, such as Cynthia Enloe and Kristen Hoganson, have highlighted the ways that US empire often depends upon celebrating a robustly militarized masculinity. By now, Countless opinion pieces and blogs decry the instrumental use of feminist objectives, such as access to education, reproductive rights, and freedom from violence, which are put to the services of US geopolitical aims. As many observers have noted, these cynical efforts, generally coming from administrations that in many other ways limit women's freedoms, often rely on a perverse voyeurism that includes wrenching descriptions of rape, floggings, and female circumcision. In my talk today, I'd like to get away from these more spectacular efforts to enlist support for U.S. foreign policy, as well as from the polemical responses they often provoke. Instead, I turn to a watershed moment in transnational feminism, the United Nations World, First World Conference of Women, which took place in Mexico City in 1975. I, I'm more than happy, probably happier than you care to indulge, uh, to talk more about the conference itself and aspects of it apart from the geopolitics. But today I'd like to focus on how geopolitics and feminism articulated at a particular moment and the legacies of this exchange. In mid-June 1975, thousands of activists, policymakers, and journalists descended on Mexico City for the International Women's Year Conference. The event took place in two locales, the official intergovernmental conference, let me see if I can do this, uh, took place at the Ministry of Foreign Relations at Tlatelolco Plaza, the site not only of the 1967 Non-Proliferation Treaty, but also the notorious 1968 student massacre. Three miles to the south, 
the modern at the modernist medical center hosted two pre-conference events a journalist encounter that was mostly to host uh, journalists coming from the third world and a seminar on women in development as well as an ngo tribune that the new york times described as the quote scene of much shouting scheming plotting and general hell raising the conference was among the first UN conferences to have a parallel NGO forum, a feature that is now standard for UN conferences. And in all, these events drew roughly 10,000 people from around the world and a vast range of perspectives. Channeling the zeitgeist of the moment, organizers and journalists alike refer to the Mexico City gathering as, quote, the greatest consciousness raising event in history. International Women's Year, or IWY as it was dubbed, took place near the beginning of what U.S. intellectual historian Dan Rogers has aptly termed the age of fracture, the, apparent, uh, the age of fracture as the apparent certainties of the post-World War II era came apart at the seams. The very stability of subjects and identities seemed to falter amid rapid globalization and both intellectual and political fragmentation. As Rogers points out, quote, the age began, as the age began, very few feminists imagined the challenge to gender norms and modes of domination that might ultimately destabilize the category of woman itself. The IWY events I'll talk about today played a critical role in this destabilization, but feminism had already fractured by the mid-1970s. Following its resurgence in the early 1960s, feminism fostered its own internal critique, splintering into liberal, socialist, liberationist, psychoanalytic, maternalist, women of color, and many others. Women professionals, inside foundations, government agencies, and the United Nations itself raised questions about women's status, even as they disavow the label of feminist for themselves. Outside of the United States and Western Europe, women connected to a host of faith-based and national liberation movements that explicitly rejected feminism, but, agi but agitated for improving women's lives in various ways. By the mid-1970s, we have to consider feminisms in the plural, and, Mexico, and in Mexico City, these different feminisms were sometimes at odds with one another. These different conceptualizations of feminism and women's activism more broadly interacted amid a changing climate for non-governmental organizations. As the historian Akira Irie has noted, the 1970s marked an explosion in both the number and importance of NGOs as a purportedly democratic alternative to state power. And political scientists Margaret Keck and Catherine Sikink have demonstrated the ways that women's organizations took particular advantage of the opportunities that the new NGO climate created giving women access to policy-making debates from which they formerly had been excluded. NGOs played an, uh, an important role at the UN since its charter, and at the UN Commission on the Status of Women, there were except had exceptionally strong ties to the Women's International NGOs, or WINGOs, as they were called. But with the flowering of feminist movements, WINGOs, which tended to be more conventional, hewing to UN protocols and protecting their UN consultative status, no longer dominated the landscape of women's civil society organizations. By the 1970s, the question was whether women's NGOs should look more like this or like this. <laughs> the mid-19, that's the book cover, because Stephanie was asking me, that's the cover for the new book. <laughs> um, the mid-1970s were a moment of tremendous upheaval in both geopolitics and feminism transforming women's activism and social movements more generally and not transforming women's activism and social movements more generally and not just in the United States but around the world in the space of a generation everything had changed former colonies had become new nations vietnam had become a quagmire and an icon of us militarism liberation movements of all kinds had fragmented and proliferated Watergate and count, countless revelations of official abuse of power around the world had badly eroded public confidence in governments Amid cresting waves of decolonization, the UN General Assembly had become ground zero for the exploding world order, where the United States in particular had become patria non grata. UN Ambassador George H.W. Bush increasingly found himself isolated. Although he thought the United States had triumphed over its Soviet rival on what he dubbed motherhood issues, such as world disarmament and strengthening international security, Bush noted the coming challenge posed by, quote, the majority of poorer, weaker, smaller nations in the UN who are aware that rich, large, powerful nations are in the minority and can be outvoted. Uh, for those of you who haven't been thinking about the UN for the past decade, <laughs> here it is. Uh, while the UN Security Council has five permanent members with veto power, and since 1965, 10 additional rotating members representing the geopolitical blocs, 
the General Assembly ballooned with the creation of newly decolonized nations. From its 51 founding members, it grew to 76 in 1955, to 117 by 1965, and to 144 in 1975. If the, if the Security Council mostly showcased Cold War rivalry between the Soviet Union and the United States, the General Assembly increasingly displayed the tensions between industrialized countries and the non-aligned Group of 77. Both of these geopolitical dynamics, that is to say the Cold War rivalry between the U.S. and the Soviet Union and the tensions between developing worlds, between industrialized countries and developing countries, so-called, you know, in giant scare quotes, uh, both of these dynamics would shape the International Women's Year from its inception. The fact that International Women's Year and the IWI conference in particular occurred at all was itself the product of geopolitics. In 1972, the communist bloc NGO, the Women's International Democratic Federation, or the WIDF as it was known by its acronym, convinced a Romanian delegate to propose a UN Year of the Woman at the Commission on the Status of Women. So let me just go back so you remember where that is. The Commission on the Status of Women is one of the standing commissions that I can talk more about it later if you like, but um, it's a Baroque bureaucracy over there. Uh, on its face, the proposal to have an International Women's Year seemed innocuous enough. Theme years were in vogue in the UN during, this, during these years, and the pro proposal called on the UN to assess the Commission's prog progress in improving women's status. It also suggested 1975 as the year to take stock. However, the WIDF clearly intended its proposal to show up the United States' poor record on human rights treaties. By the mid-1970s, the, mid the Soviet Union had signed all but one of the eight instruments related to women's status, demurring on the widely unpopular convention defining the terms of consent, consent to marry, while the United States had only signed the Convention on Trafficking. The United States had not, for example, signed the conventions on women's political rights or the nationality of married women, nor those related to discrimination in employment and education. 1975 also coincided with the 30th anniversary of the WIDF's founding and its planned World Congress on Women. So it clearly was going to be a giant celebration for the WIDF, um, and this raised red flags for, uh, for the Cold Warriors and the, on the Commission Status of Women. The WIDF was founded in 1974, sorry, in 1945 to protest the use of nuclear weapons in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and had been the target of Cold Warriors, U.S. Cold Warriors for decades. The U.S. State Department repeatedly refused it to issue visas to WIDF representatives attending meetings at U.N. headquarters in New York City. And its proposal to, for International Women's Year inevitably met with suspicion from the U.S. representatives and their allies. That suspicion would only grow as they learned that the WIDF's World Congress had been planned for East Berlin in October of 1975. Now that got the State Department's attention. The U.S. had largely ignored International Women's Year up to this point, allocating a piddling $36,000 to fund the U.S. Center for International Women's Year. But the combination of rising temperature at the U.N. General Assembly and the specter of having the principal IWI event take place behind the Iron Curtain made it suddenly seem like an opportunity to burnish the U.S. government's reputation both at home and abroad. The State Department sent the Republican Party activist and, anti and ardent anti-communist uh, Pat Patricia Hattar to represent the United States at the Commission on the Status of Women's meeting early, in early 1974. There she would propose an alternative confer conference that would take place in a developing country. Hattar's proposal did not come entirely out of left field well, or right field, as in her case, uh, the Commission on Status of Women had repeatedly called for an international women's conference, although what they clearly envisioned was more of a white glove gathering of consultative status at Wingo's. However, while the proposal for International Women's Year as a theme year had enjoyed unanimous support in the Commission, the proposal for a conference decidedly did not. Many representatives, particularly those aligned with the Soviet bloc, argued that a theme conference was simply an expensive gimmick, a distraction from the need to ratify and implement the UN instruments that already existed to improve women's status. While Hattar contended the Soviets simply feared the UN-sponsored conference would eclipse the WIDF's East Berlin meeting, more seasoned particip participants recognized that the expensive thematic conferences had become an increasingly contentious issue at the United Nations. The General Assembly had approved IWI with the stipulation that it take place, quote, within existing resources. No one disputed whether conferences took up compelling issues. Recent gatherings had examined issues such as human rights, disarmament, racism, environment, and food supply, as well as more specialized questions such as the law of the sea. 
But they, what they disputed, rather, was whether these confer conferences accomplished more than the less costly and more localized efforts. The resolution for the conference carried in the end, but with, a, but with many more negative and abstention votes than, norm, than was normally seen in a commission that operated by strong consensus. Bush's, uh, George W. Bush's uh, successor as UN ambassador to the UN, John Scali, crowed that the United States had achieved, had, had claimed a quote, new human rights leadership in the role of equal rights for women. And the session revealed the clear Soviet bias against equality for women while drawing support from both non-aligned countries and the People's Republic of China. The General Assembly voted on the IWI conference amid one of the most tumultuous sessions in UN history that included not only a historic visit by PLO, but Palestine Liberation Organization leader Yasser Arafat, by also, but also votes on the, on the Charter on the Economic Rights and Duties of States, a proposal that was intended to codify what was called the New International Economic Order to claim third world sovereignty over national resources. Um, so the Charter on the Economic Rights and Duties of States, as well as notably the su suspension of the credentials of South Africa's apartheid government. Anne Tuckerman, a veteran UN reporter for the Agence France Presse, tried to explain to an audience gathered to learn about IWY, quote, what kind of place is, is the UN which is transformed today into a fortress where the main speaker of the day arrives by helicopter like James Bond? It is a place of revolution, a place where the most militant wing of the third world is waging its struggle against the old establishment and winning, at least in words and on paper, and words and paper help when they are loud and repeated and backed by Arab oil. The fact that Arafat would be welcomed as, as head of state during the very week the General Assembly voted 125 to 1 to suspend South Africa offered powerful evidence that a new era had dawned at the UN. Tuckerman, uh, Tuckerman concluded with a caveat, however, for activists in the audience who hoped this transformed UN would prove to be a feminist asset. Quote, the UN can be a highly useful tool for governments that seek an international seal to diplomatic moves or for those that want a public forum to air their grievances, she explained. For individuals rebelling against established authorities, it is and most likely will remain unavailable. The IWY conference, now approved, would center on three themes of equality, development, and peace, symbolized, as several reporters observed, by a plumpish peace dove with a mathematical equal sign where its tail feathers should sprout. As anodyne as they must have seemed, soporific platitudes, as one UN staffer described them, observers in the press, NGOs, and the foundation community glossed these themes as demarcating political inter geopolitical interests, with the industrialized countries focusing on equality, third world countries emphasizing development, and the Soviet bloc countries stressing peace. While this mapping reflected at least an impressionistic sense of rhetorical divisions and the UN's geopolitical balancing act, Making these themes seem straightforward and mutually understood, understood frustrated all attempts to describe even the basic contours of such abstract ideas. Did equality imply equal rights, which might ignore, ignore issues such as, as maternity, or equal opportunities, which might accommodate maternity demands? Would protectionist nationalism or free market liberalism best serve the objective of third world development? And did peace mean an absence of nuclear weapons, an end to foreign occupation, or the curtailment of revolutionary violence. Even within the UN orbit, a growing cadre of women interrogated conventional wisdoms. In a critical challenge to the modernization model, Danish economist Esther Bosrup argued that both the metrics used to gauge economic growth, uh, that both of the metrics used to gauge economic growth systematically excluded most women's labor and the contemporary development schemes with their emphasis on mechanization and commodities production contributed to women's economic marginality and increased their labor burdens. By 1975, Bozrop had galvanized the women in development movement and suddenly women seemed in indispensable to development projects. This context where the global political order seemed to be in a flux and the United Nations emerged as a stage for geopolitical struggle created an opportunity for mid-level diplomatic powers that could serve as intermediaries between wealthier industrialized countries and the increasingly vocal G77, Group of 77, the United Nations instantiation of the non-aligned movement. Three countries in particular, Mexico, Australia, and Iran, identified Women's International Women's Year as an opportunity to gain stature amid this diplomatic shakeup. Mexican President Luisa Echeverria had played an instrumental role in crafting and shepherding the Charter on the Economic Rights and Duties of States. This is the charter that was approved the same session that they approved International Women's Year and suspended uh, South Africa. 
Uh, in fact, members of the Echeverria government refer to it as the Carta Echeverria consistently to, to kind of see, uh, uh, solidify that association between the Charter and the Echeverria government. From plans to hold the International Women's Year Conference in Bogota, Colombia fell through, Mexico enthusiastically offered to host. Echeverria at this point openly jockeyed to succeed Kurt Waldheim as UN Secretary General and quickly put measures in place to bring Mexico in line with UN priorities regarding population control and political equality. Indeed, even as equal rights amendments stalled out in the United States, Mexico amended its, the fourth article of its constitution to begin, quote, man and woman are equal before the law. Inspired by the growing dynamism of the women's movement, Australian Prime Minister Gough Whitman, Whitlam created a new position of advisor on women's affairs. Whitlam's Secretary of Labor and Immigration, Peter Walensky, reportedly told him, quote, I just spent time in the States and I've seen this burgeoning women movement, women's movement. It's going to be one of the greatest social justice movements of our century and I think you should bring onto your staff somebody that will speak with the voice of that movement. He appointed the 30-year-old philosopher and women's liberationist Elizabeth Reed, who would come to play a starring role both during the conference preparation and during the conference itself. Reed brought to the position a commitment to the principles of open deliberation and cultural revolution, contrasting sharply with the more traditional wingos that had dominated the Australian, Australian scene up to that point. She also oversaw a fund of $2 million Australian dollars to support IWI activities, a sum that dwarfed IWI budgets in most other countries, most notably that of the United States. The opportunity for mid-level powers in, resulted partly from the fact that the General Assembly had allocated only $266,000 for International Women's Year, compared to $3 million for the 1974 Population Conference and $900,000 for the same year's conference on food. Indeed, the General Assembly only reluctantly agreed to create even a voluntary fund to which member states, NGOs, and individuals could contribute. As a result, IWI funding always had sort of a bake sale feel about it. Member states were slow to, slow to pledge support and even slower to come up with actual cash. But the IWI Voluntary Fund had received a steady stream of small personal contributions, some for as little as $2. IWI organizers suggested selling IWI bracelets produced by the Franklin Mint, and a ubiquitous, the ubiquitous IWI logo would appear on a motley array of trinkets, potholders, and fabrics, and of course, commemorative stamps, ever, always commemorative stamps. When deliberations were afoot about which countries should have representatives on the IWI Consultative Committee, a group that would set the conference agenda, Australia ponied up $40,000 for the IWI Voluntary Fund, securing Elizabeth Reed a seat at the table. And then Princess Ashraf Pahlavi, the Iranian Shah's twin sister, pledged a million dollars in support of IWI activities and an additional million dollars, you can do this if you're the Shah of Iran, <laughs> an additional million dollars to establish a research center in Tehran. Pahlavi was quickly named the chair of the consultative committee. <laughs> Princess Ashraf's role particularly highlighted the power of money and politics in shaping the International Women's Year agenda. The WIDF, WIDF leader who had initially proposed International Women's Year to the Commission on the Status of Women and who had shepherded it through the UN was an Iranian dissident named Shahnaz Alami. I'm probably butchering that name for any Farsi speakers here, I apologize. Uh, Shahnaz Alami who lived as, in exile in Berlin as soon as, the General, as soon as the General Assembly approved the International Women's Year Conference, two NGO groups had begun organizing almost simultaneously. Alami chaired a Geneva-based group that focused on human rights, and Esther Heimer of the International Federation of Business and Professional Women chaired a New York-based group that focused on development. These two groups reflected not only the Cold War, War rivalry that had simmered between Wingos over the past, previous two decades, but also the shifting center of gravity for women's issues at the UN, as a section on women's status shifted its affiliation from human rights to humanitarian and social affairs. The New York group consisted entirely of locals and mostly Judeo-Christian groups. And it was actually housed in this Methodist building right across from UN headquarters. Uh, and the Geneva group, by contrast, was far more cosmopolitan and included illustrious members such as the Ghanaian diplomat Jean-Martin Cizé, the first, first woman to preside over the Security Council. Through most of 1974, the two groups operated on parallel tracks, warily eyeing one another and occasionally sniping that the other was, not, was overstepping its authority and failing to consult the other. In the end, the New York group had a few advantages over the Geneva group, despite its parochial nature. 
It's small and local membership allowed it to meet more regularly, and most of its members had worked together in the NGO forum on the August 1974 Population Conference, where they had scored a major triumph adding women's issues to the UN Plan of Action. I just, as an aside here, want to stress that the 1974 original UN Plan of Action on Population didn't mention women. So we'll get back to that later. But I just, so they, this, and this group of NGOs came in and had this major victory and be able to get some plank onto the, onto the plan of action that dealt with actual women. Um, they were, so they returned from Bucharest where the conference had taken place, flushed with their victory, and eager to take control of the Mexico City Conference. As time and money were both in short supply, the combination of logistics and Princess Ostroff's donation ensured that Shanaz Alami, the WIDF, and the Geneva Group were shut out of Mexico City planning. Having taken control of the NGO Tribune, the New York City group was determined to keep the gathering focused on what they called women's issues, as they understood them, preventing politics, again, as they understood politics, from intruding and overshadowing matters most pressing for women's status. All of the concerns that most preoccupied the Geneva group, human rights, nuclear disarmament, decolonization, racial discrimination, were set aside as distractions. But for many participants, the idea that women's issues or anything else ex existed outside of politics would be like expecting to live outside of gravity. The pull of politics acted upon everything. The New York organizers imagined they acted within their own prevailing, uh, sorry, themselves acted within their own prevailing ideology, emphasizing individual and cultural solutions over collective and structural ones. In a critical decision, however, Mildred Persinger, and I've said the only like r remotely contemporary photo I can find is this one from two years later at the Houston so, so this is so United States, which is that there's another IWI conference. It actually happens it's in 1977, so not during International Women's Year in Houston, and it's not international. But this is from that conference. There's another book on that. I can tell you about that later. Uh, so, but Mildred Persinger, who's the who's um, pictured here on your right. Um, uh, a gracious Virginian fr uh, from the World YWCA was appointed to organize the NGO Tribune in Mexico City. The world YWCA in this world, this universe of wingos, had a particularly strong record for fighting racism around the world. And it, it actually was probably best, sort of like those mid-level diplomatic powers, best positioned to negotiate between you know, the WIDF and these sort of left-leaning, peace-oriented uh, wingos and things like the business and, and professional women and the International Council of Women on the other end of the Cold War spectrum. Um, uh, started fighting, fighting racism around the world, and Persinger herself had worked with the civil rights movement in Virginia before marrying and moving to Dobbs Ferry, New York. Persinger made the game-changing decision to change the NGO Tribune from a small gathering of consultative status NGOs to an open forum to which anyone was welcome. She worked tirelessly to populate the program with speakers from third world countries. Several funding agencies, at, really at her behest, specified that their support would be earmarked for this purpose, a decision that served a didactic purpose, although quite different, a quite different one than some envisioned. Ford Foundation Program Officer Eleanor Barber explained in an, in an eternal memo justifying this funding, quote, the explicit purpose of the Tribune is to show how diverse women's problems are, that women in different parts of the world have different needs and aspirations. Since there is some apprehension about the domination of the NGO conference by women from the United States and perhaps other developed countries who are assumed to lean toward women, uh, Western style, quote unquote, women's lib, an implicit purpose is to educate these Western women about the problems of other women, especially those around the, in the third world. Now, not everybody agreed that increasing the number of third world participants would contribute to the Tribune's success. New York Organizing Committee member Sammy, Fanny Simon, representing the International Council of De Social Democratic Women, wrote to Persinger, my own first reaction to the Tribune program was, heavens, are we reproducing the Tribune, in the Tribune the conditions in the General Assembly? A substantial number should be from developing countries, especially as the emphasis of the World Conference will be on development. And yet, is it not, is not a distribution of about 70 to 30 percent rather excessive? Those from developed countries can learn from the developing countries, but so can those from the developing learn from the developed. She remarked that Persinger, quote, certainly must have gone out of her way to minimize the participants from North America and objected in particular that the program included no panelists from Israel. The New York NGO Committee, amid all this 
conversation among themselves, also still needed to convince the Mexican government to allow thousands of NGO members to Mexico just at the moment when the Echeverria administration hoped to draw international attention, a prospect that sparked considerable anxiety among planners. The Iranian UN mission member Zorai Tabatabai recalled later, quote, in those days, member states were worried about NGOs being radical revolutionaries. The idea they might be cooperative was not seen as an option. They were viewed more like rabble rousers. One New York committee member reported back from her visit to the well-resourced Mexico City office, quote, after describing what kind of animal an NGO is, I caught an anxious, I, I caught one cautious if anxious question, something like any politicos? And U.S. feminists in, and U.S. feminists and Betty Friedan in particular generated a special concern in Mexico. Though in the weeks leading up to the conference, Aida Gonzalez of Mexico's Ministry of Foreign Relations has heard that as many as 6,000 people might come from the Tribune, including, as she said, such radical elements as Betty Friedan and now. She implored the U.S. government to prevent such elements from coming to Mexico. If the New York City-based organizers imagine they might be able to police the boundary between politics and women's issues at, gather at the gatherings in Mexico City, and that anyone might agree on what, lie on, on what lay on either side of that line, they were quickly disabused of this fantasy. Demonstrations interrupted Waldheim's inaugural address as women that the Mexican government had hired to welcome participants broke out in protest and invaded the ceremony. Two days later, Winter Boynes of the Cong Congress on Racial Equality and Esther Arista of the Raso Unida Party challenged the U.S. delegation's leg legitimacy during a meeting at the U.S. Embassy. When Australian Lori Bebbington stood up and identified herself as a lesbian feminist, while sex worker rights advocate Flo, Ken advocate Flo Kennedy objected to the government serving as her quote-unquote pimp, Critics framed a zero-sum game between sexual rights and issues such as human rights and economic justice. Betty Friedan, who always drew a lot of attention everywhere she went, uh, provoked an outcry when she threatened to march up the Avenida de la Reforma. So if you remember her fifth, famous Fifth Avenue march, this is what was conjured here. Um, in protest of Attorney General Pedro Ejeda Payada's election to preside over the UN conference. While some pointed out that Ojeda, Payada, that Ojeda Payada's election simply followed UN protocols, and others argued that it would benefit the cause of women's rights to have men take more interest, some indicated that they should be concerned not about his sex, but rather his reputation for repression within Mexico. Ferdinand and others further antagonized feather, fellow attendees when they, when they arrogated to themselves the right to represent the NGO Tribune to the governmental conference, presuming to speak for an authentic feminism. She brushed off concerns that U.S. feminists dominated the NGO Tribune, explained to the New York Times reporter, we are our sister's keeper. The Mexican press responded with an attack on U.S. Fem feminism as an imperialist import, expressing particular alarm about scum in apparent belief that the Scum Manifesto spoke for an actual U.S. feminist organization. <laughs> for those of you not familiar with Scum, this is Valerie Solanas, is like she, the one who tried to kill Warhol. This is, she has actually has a great line in the interview of the Village Vanguard where she says, it's not really, it's a literary device. It's not really a thing. <laughs> um, in fact, Betty Friedan, uh, in fact, the IWI conference is often shorthanded as a confrontation between Betty Friedan, representing first world liberal white feminism, and Bolivian labor activist Domitila Barrios de Chungara, symbolizing third world militant non-white Marxism. That encounter is apocryphal, although there's certainly an interesting conversation to be had about why it stands as a synecdoche for this moment. The actual confrontation that took place between Barrios de Chungara and the Mexican feminist, arguably uh, Ferdinand's Mexican analog, Esperanza Prisa de Martí, uh, so this is the actual conversation that took place. Brito de Martí agreed with Ferdam and other U.S. feminists that the Tribune needed to unify around so-called women's issues unadulterated by politics. Uh, rumors circulated uh, among U.S. participants of the so-called disruptors who disagreed with their priorities, including those who had protested at the U.S. Embassy, embassy, had been paid either by the CIA or by the Mexican government to prevent feminist success. Most notably, during the final days of the IWI gathering, the Intergovernmental Conference approved the first official UN document that would equate, equate Zionism with racism. Although the conference committee had rejected the inclusion of the word sexism as a, so, a quote unquote nasty North American neologism 
Zionism was included alongside, quote, alien and colonial domination, foreign occupation, racial discrimination, apartheid, and neocolonialism in all its forms. So in the enumeration of impediments to women's liberation, Zionism was in and sexism was out. By the end of 1975, the UN General Assembly had voted on a resolution labeling Zionism as racism, we can talk about that more later if you like, and clearly planned to put Israel on the same blacklist with South Africa. Many accounts, particularly US participants' accounts, describe all this open conflict as leading to the failure of the Mexico City Conference. Some historical perspective, I, my historical perspective it turns out, uh, allows us to see that the heterogeneity and entropy that took hold, particularly at the NGO Tribune, exemplify the unpredictable encounters that pol the political philosopher Jacques Rancière dubs dissensus and anthropologist Anna Singh describes as the, as the production, productive friction of global encounters. There actually is an inverse correlation between how carefully planned and consensus-driven any element of IWY was and the durability of its legacy. The most enduring outcomes of IWY, in other words, emerged from those encounters that allowed for generative conflict and debate. Although the UN operates, itself operates overwhelmingly by consensus, the UN-sponsored women's conferences, and there were others that followed, uh, and agencies have functioned more as incubators of dissent, as spaces of persistent and animating critique. The disagreements, miscommunications, and even traded accusations allow participations to, participants to see more clearly the stakes of their position and to forge bonds of solidarity with others who shared their priorities. One of the most important legacies of the Mexico City Conference was not a policy development or any single organization, but rather the deep and enduring networks that it forged, cultivating a shared vocabulary and endeavors that have sustained transnational and increasingly diverse feminisms. International Women's Year started as a seat of the pants affair, initially envisioned as a series of women's art, art and film festivals and seminars, but ended up as the event that fostered a transformative organizational infrastructure for women's issues and launched countless careers in policymaking. Let me see if I can get this to work. Uh, in, a, in a 2005 interview with Wangari Maathai, the Nobel laureate who founded Kenya's Greenbelt Movement, she describes a process that took place all over the world, although it had a far greater impact outside the United States and Western Europe, as countless NGOs appeared and as countless new NGOs appeared and governments created bureaucratic infrastructure and devoted resources to concerns brought forward by women. I'm going to see if I can let you hear this in her voice, which is nicer than my voice. Uh, play. And it was around mid 1970. 1970s and many women will remember those were the that was the year when women of the world met in Mexico during the very first United Nations conference on women it was that conference by the way that declared the first women decade and we were preparing in Kenya f for us to go and participate at that meeting and it was during that preparation that I listened to the women from the rural areas and as they articulated their issues, their agendas, their concerns, I noticed that they were talking about the need for firewood, the need for energy, the need for clean drinking water, the need for food, and the need for income. And all of these connected very closely to the environment. So activists like Wangari Maathai would use the UN's commitment to improving women's status in particular, over coming years, the reporting requirements associated with the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, or CEDAW, to pressure their home governments to make political and juridical changes. Mexico was one of several countries, clearly not including the United States, that used the occasion of IWI to pass constitutional amendments to bring their laws into conformity with UN conventions. The UN would hold three more women's conferences, 1980 in Copenhagen, although that one was originally planned for Tehran and moved for obvious reasons, uh, in 1985 in Nairobi and in 1995 in Beijing. As the political scientist Elizabeth J. Friedman demonstrates, activists also managed, as she puts it, gender the agendas of conferences on a wide range of issues such as environment, human rights, and development, marking a stark contrast for the exclusion of women and gender from the 1974 conferences on population and food. After the Mexico City Conference, the IWY Voluntary Fund became UNIFEM, the UN Development Fund for Women. And discussion in Mexico City about women's difficulties accessing credit led to the creation of the Women's World Banking, an organization called Women's World Banking, and the turn to women's microcredit as a development strategy. 
the Pahlavi-funded Women's Research and Training Institute, which originally opened in Tehran under Elizabeth Reed's leadership, became INSTRA, the UN's International Research and Training Institute for the Advancement of Women, which opened in Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic in 1983. And the two most influential third world women's networks, the Encuentros Feministas Latinoamericanas, the, sorry, the Feminist Latin American Encounters, or, or uh, Encuentros Feministas Latinoamericanas, uh, and DAWN, the development, uh, uh, development alternative for, new, for women of a new era, grew out of encounters in Mexico City, and those organizations continue today. These endeavors have, in turn, encouraged a host of feminist-inspired reforms, ranging from participatory budgeting and campaigns against gender violence to language reforms and a thoroughgoing interrogation of masculine norms and political and economic practices. None of these endeavors developed beyond the reach of geopolitics, but they bore the unmistakable imprint of feminist ideas and debates. Indeed, geopolitical rivalries compelled the United Nations to develop the organizational infrastructure that facilitated the development of transnational feminist endeavors and networks. And meanwhile, particularly after International Women's Year, feminist debates and interventions enduringly reshaped not only the issues that would be included in geopolitical debates, but also the very form in which those debates might take place. Thank you. I'm happy to talk about anything. <laughs> Did, Jennifer? Other Jen, Jennifer, right? Yes. yes. Um, Other Jennifer. <laughs> so I really enjoyed the talk. Um, Thank you. And so I'm going to narrow in on, on one thing that you mentioned at the end, which is the absence of women in the food and development part. Um, Weird. I'm so it's really, uh, that's actually really, so, um, you know, obviously by, after this conference, there, there's just a sense that development can't, it, it, it can't exclude women and that there are aspects of develop, of modernization oriented concepts of development that create additional burdens for women and, and increase marg marginalization. Weirdly, in the early 1970s, that wasn't, even though Esther Bozrop's book comes out in 1970 and already had, I think, had a powerful influence within these policymaking circles by the early 70s, when they formulate the agendas for both the food conference and the population conference, so two areas where you would think women, I mean, in most of the world, women do much of the food production and cultivation and nearly all of the food preparation, right? So if you're talking about food scarcity, What's that? And they are responsible for a certain amount of the population. And, and the, I mean, part of it was, I think, a tension around the question of population in the, the mid-1970s between the people who were terrified about a population explosion um, and who are trying to limit the population, and mostly by that they may limit the population of poorer, darker people on the planet. Not, they're not, and there's a critique, of course, that's saying, if we're concerned about resources, how about if we start with limiting the highest consuming populations, right? That would be like the highest impact way if you're worried about the fate of the planet. Um, so there's this, and this is part of what, um, you know, I, I gave that quotation for, from George H.W. Bush, who was the ambassador, but there's, there's all of these conversations happening within the State Department where they're trying to figure out how they can square this circle, right? Which is that they, it's not, politically feasible within the United States to say, I mean, for example, one suggestion was, well, if we told people to limit the amount of meat they eat in the United States, yeah. then that, then we would solve the food crisis. Like, then we wouldn't have a food crisis anymore. In fact, we wouldn't have a population crisis either. And if, that's just not, you know, that's even before, well, that is mid-Atkins diet, isn't it? That's like, you know, in high Atkins diet, that's not, but like, truly, it's like, it's not, um, it's just not politically palatable in, the, in places, well, in the United States in particular, but in, in places in developed countries to say, here's a solution, you could slow consumption. Um, so what it, what's interesting is that you see this, this um, and what I, that kind of articulation with geopolitics and, and, and feminism, the women who, those wingos who show up at the population conference do not self-identify as feminist. They don't. But they, they clearly have taken with them certain ideas that population control can't simply be about, I mean, Milda Persinger, who's this just like, she's so mild-mannered, but she has this moment when she's reporting back from this conference to the, that New York committee where she says, 
it's like they didn't know who had the babies, you know? And she's just, you can see this just like immense frustration that's not articulated as a feminist critique, but it is articulated as you cannot keep talking about population and not talk about women. Now, you know, the, the liberal feminist line on this was, if you give women more education and, and um, ca kind of career or work opportunities, then that it, there, of course, is a strong correlation between women's levels of education and fertility decline. So inverse correlation, I should say. Um, a lot of, you know, folks from the third world were saying the answer is not that you, like, we, that's not the answer that we want. What we want is for you to stop telling us how to, I, I should I say, for those who aren't familiar with this moment in, in the mid-1970s, in the United States, of course, there had been a lot of um, involuntary uh, uh, sterilizations happening in, um, in, in my adopted state of North Carolina, there were quite a few, uh, in California, um, particularly of Chicana populations, and that all was, was coming out. So there was all of these disclosures happening that, in particular, African-American women and, and Chicana women, but also, um, uh, as, as we saw with the recent, uh, uh, was it Tube into the Biography of Brandeis, that um, the, the involuntary um, sterilizations of so-called feeble women, right, that, um, I, that all of this was, coming out, and so this again was something that, a critique that comes from the feminist movement, um, but that, and, and is directed at USAID. There's this amazing, and I'll, I'll say this one last thing and then I'll stop, but there's this amazing moment at that confrontation where Winter Boynes and Esther Risa are, are, are at the, where um, they're saying, because this guy Daniel Parker, who's the, from the Parker Pen Company, is, is he's the director of USAID and he's, the heading the delegation, the women's delegation. And they're saying, like, you can't, you, like, white guy, do not represent us brown women at, at anything, right? And so the, it's this, like, big confrontation over the center identity politics and whatever. And they're going through the, the um, all of the members of the delegation, the members of the U.S. delegation, and there's one other man on the delegation, another guy from USAID, and he starts talking about um, the importance of providing possibilities for fertility control in the third world. And that a lot of women want to be able to control their own fertility. And someone yells out from the audience, have you had a vasectomy? Mm -hmm. And he says, yes. Yeah. And there's this whole, like, like, it's just crazy. Like, I don't think I've ever seen that kind of conversation happen in, like, a, a diplomatic setting before. Anyway, so it's this, but it's this time when, like, all of these fights are in play. Anyway, I, just, I could talk about this forever. I'm sorry. <laughs> Jenny, you had a question. Yes. Um, I loved the, first of all, thank you so much for this really interesting talk. I loved your description of the group of, of uh, organizers for whom, as you said, everything was political. And I'm wondering, though, how, for, if, for them, how much of, of everything was geopolitical? Were they uh -huh. looking at these things in terms of local national concerns? Were they really looking at this in terms of Geopolitics, also, how much were they were they thinking of these issues as being, uh, you know, given the, the, the room in which we're sitting at this moment, were they thinking in terms of international securities coming out uh -huh. of these, uh, uh, being related to the to some of these very important uh, issues that were up uh, for discussion? Right. So there's a couple of different things that there. One is there's a group of these who are coming. Um, particular. So that Geneva group that Shnaz Alami is running and that's has a lot of women from the WIDF um, and a lot of women involved in human rights has a very, very high representation of post-colonials, right? So um, women coming out of either current ongoing national liberation movements or recently concluded national liberation movements. And for them, it's geopolitical in the sense that it, it is about fighting empire. And they are still like, uh, I mean, in the middle of the conference, Mozambique gets independence and get, like, they rush to get them an invitation to the conference. Right? And there's all this discussion about which national liberation movements will be given the, because of course all these national liberation movements are completely fragmented, right? Which one gets the imprimatur to come attend the conference, but they have them. So for those groups, it is always involved, at least with geopolitics in that, in the sense of decolonization movements. Um, there's this other part of it, and Dory Noyce was, was, was with me at, uh, we were fellows together at a, at a um, center in Princeton, the, the Davis Center, where one of our other fellows was working on this theme of peace, with uh, Petra Gooda, who was working on this theme of peace as a... Oh, who's fabulous, if you have a chance. Uh, she's, um, her work is absolutely fabulous. And, and what, 
what she writes about is the peace is this, uh, so it gets attacked by the U.S. State Department as a kind of cynical manipulation. But they, you know, that, the, and, and as a theme category for International Women's Year, is a catch-all for nuclear disarmament, which is their single, as you know, single biggest thing, um, but also for anti-apartheid, anti-racial discrimination, right? And this is a place, I was going to say still in 1975, still in 2017, um, but that racial discrimination is an issue on which the United States is very vulnerable, right? And so for, if you're a Soviet looking to embarrass the United States, that's the place that you go, right? And so these, these questions, I mean, I, I, it's, I think it's difficult, I cannot, without putting them on the couch, I'm not sure that I can disentangle how much of that is a sincere concern about racial discrimination and how much of that is a geopolitical, you know, punch to, to like say, you know, you get off your moral high, high ground because you don't have any authority. And, and, and by continually, and of course, as I, I'm sure many of you know who, who, there was somebody in the room earlier who worked on apartheid, on anti-apartheid movements is that person telling? Oh, yes, anti-apartheid movements. Um, so, as you know better than I do, um, you know, the United States was on the wrong side of that fight and and remained on the wrong side of that fight, and so until embarrassingly late in the game. And so, again, anti-apartheid was one of these things. So, the the whole move to suspend, um, you, you know, who the one no vote was against suspending. <laughs> it was the United States. The United States was the only country to vote against suspending South African credentials at the United Nations. Um, at the General Assembly, and, and it was the only one that supported it at the Security Council as well. Um, and so including Britain, which is interesting, right? So um, it was a, a, um, a major issue. Does that, make, does that answer your question? Yes. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, one of the images that you showed us was taken at a UN-sponsored international encounter. And oh. That was just what it said in the caption. Oh, this one with Elizabeth Reed? Yes. That one, yeah. And I was just wondering, is an international encounter something that happened more than once? Or is it sort of a one so encounter, I just like... It's totally, I just, can I say like encounters one of these like 1970s words that I just love? So they also have the journalist encounter, like everything is an encounter and, and they also, they also refer to it as a happening. <laughs> a happening, we can have more happenings. Um, so the international encounter, what happened was essentially they ran out of time to plan this conference and so Ashraf, Princess Ashraf gives a million dollars, chairs the committee and plans this thing. And so they organized this international encounter just prior to that consultative committee meeting. They invite Elizabeth Reed, um, Alvin Toffler, the population bomb guy. Who else was there? Uh, uh, um, Annie Giag, who's a Ghanaian Supreme Court justice and who was very assertive about the fact that uh, in, in a, a sort of a, articulating a dependency analysis that like third world poverty is because of first world wealth. I mean, it was a really interesting. So it was basically an effort to kind of stage a conversation that involved sometimes, so Liz Reed is there representing the, the Australian government, but a lot of um, intellectuals, uh, there's a, a really kind of funny, although sad exchange of where uh, Betty Friedan shows up and makes it, she's not invited to be part of it, but she shows up and makes this big stink and starts you know, giving this whole critique and people start writing letters, the organizers saying, somebody has to get to for Betty Friedan before Mexico City, like she's gonna ruin everything. So it's, it's, it's meant to be this thing that's like a general, like what are the women's issues, the staging before they, they start this, um, the, the consultative committee meeting, but encounter was one of these words that comes up, they have a lot of encounter sessions, it's, it's a thing in the 70s. And also, uh, yeah, you in the way back there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, thank you so much for this really rich talk. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about Zionism in mm -hmm. Israel, because it came up repeatedly. And, it, and I, I guess I'm sort of thinking of it in relation to the argument about this being a really formative moment for yeah. the sort of future transnational yeah. network. So, so Zionism. Um, uh, as some of you may know, Zionism. And I say, in the middle of this conference. And this is a little bit inside baseball, but maybe for the U.S. historians, this will be of interest. Dana Patrick Moynihan replaces John Scully as the ambassador to the United, U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, and he is particularly concerned about this issue. And it, um, there's some stuff written about it. I, I can give you my old little critique of all of it, but like, there's nothing, nothing I'm really excited about this. Room. There are a few books that are written about this particular moment on um, 
the Zionism is racism debates. What, uh, clearly, that vote on South Africa is a setup to try. Like, South Africa is kind of the target. Israel is really the target. And um, this is this whole moment of what the State Department folks refer to as log rolling between African countries, particularly sub-Saharan African countries, and Arab oil producing countries. And they keep thinking they can split it up, right? That they can divide the non-aligned movement. And that if, you know, the surely material interests will lead to a divide. And it just doesn't crack. And it's very, very frustrating for you, for, I mean, for Moynihan in particular. And so at the end of 1975, they have um, this resolution, which Mexico really strongly advocates. Like Mexico is one of the biggest advocates, in part because Echeverria has these global, in Mexico, you can have one six-year presidential term and then you're done. And so he's like looking to the next thing, and his next thing is he's going to succeed of all time. And the way he thinks he's going to do that, to become Secretary General, you have to have uh, support of the General Assembly and of the Security Council, essentially. And so he's trying to, like, kind of court all this favor. And um, it becomes a huge problem for Mexico. The Jewish community in the United States stages a tourist boycott of Mexico um, because of his support for the – and he has to, he has to, you know, step back, from, do this whole rollback from it. And the Emilio Rabasa, who was the Minister of Foreign Relations, ends up having to resign over and all this stuff. Um, and it, it becomes one of the most, I would say, one of the most controversial moments in UN history is that vote. Um, and then it, you know, it ha I would say, you know, given the vote that's just recently happened about Israel, I don't think that issue has really gone, well, obviously the issue has not gone away, but, um, you know, I think it's, it stayed very much alive. But it was that, that trying to link um, Zionism with apartheid was a really particular move. I thought that answers your question, but that's kind of the moment we're in. You had a question up here, yeah. <laughs> you may not be very to ask a historian of Prince this question, but uh, I'm a member of a lot of faculty, so I've Oh, good. Um, we have some questions for you as well, I might add. <laughs> <laughs> well, they may have said that. So, you may have seen the, the order that, the executive order that launched uh, a thousand ships, yes. To go to their airports, um, includes as one of its purposes explicitly, you know, protecting. Oppress others. I mean, this is kind of unbelievable that I swear it's true. Um, <laughs> oppress others based on um, race, religion, sex, or sexual orientation. Right. And, and I guess I'm wondering, <laughs> you know, if, if everybody in the world well, we're all wondering. Okay. this is just, you know, the Trump administration trolling or what, um, that's one thing. But I'm wondering whether it actually, whether your historical perspective leads you to think this could actually exacerbate kind of schisms between progressive feminist, feminist in the Islamic world and, and the U.S. countries? Oh, that's an interesting question. I didn't think that's where you were going, and it got really interesting there at the end. Um, because uh, there were so many things where I was like, you're wondering, <laughs> I'm wondering, um, this because this administration has uh, surprised me at every turn. Um, I, my sense, so here's what I think one of the, the dynamics that I think is does continue from the 70s and that I'm a little astonished persists, which is that zero-sum game between sexual rights and social, like, economic justice. And why it persists, I can't quite wrap my head around. Like, why is it that marriage equality would be at odds with economic equality? I don't know. But there's, there's I, think we, I think we saw a little bit of that in this last election, right? On the other hand, I don't, I mean, maybe it's, this is, again, I'm more comfortable talking about things than if I can look at, you know, with some arm's length. Um, and I, it may just be the news sources and social media sources that I look at. My sense is, so, all caveats, right? Like, I, disclaimer is duly noted. I, this seems only to have strengthened that commitment between U.S. feminists and, and middle, like, feminists in the middle. Like, I, I my sense is that, there's a, 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 I mean, I think that there's, if Donald Trump has managed to do one thing, it's unite um, some pretty diverse, like, forces that were actually kind of squabbling a bit until, you know, I, I was talking to a friend of mine who was supposed to be on, uh, who, who was, in fact, on Democracy Now! the night of election, and he said, I had all these talking points about how we had to still struggle against neoliberalism, the Clintonian neoliberalism, blah, 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 and then he said to throw all those notes out, and, you know, suddenly it's like, okay, let's start talking to the Clintons again. <laughs> I mean, it's, I, I, 
my sense, though, is that, that that as a wedge hasn't really worked. I mean, it's so ham-fisted and cynical that I think people have kind of seen through that. But maybe I'm just being optimistic. I, I hope that I'm right, of course. <laughs> um, but I don't, I have not as of yet seen any evidence of that. I mean, of, of the kind of using it. And I think that part of that may actually be, I'm talking as I think here, which is always a mistake, but uh, but it may be a little bit of, because we have, st starting at least from the Bush administration, and really, like I said earlier, this feminist critique that has been really thoroughgoing of the U.S. kind of cynically using that, playing that card. And so I think people are kind of on the lookout for that. I hope that people don't fall for that because it's, it's really, it really is an incredibly cynical move. But yeah, I hope I, I'm not sure I reassured you, but <laughs> any other, yeah, Catherine. Yeah, I, thank you for your wonderful talk. Thank um, you. <laughs> I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about whether any human rights activists were interested in mm -hmm. international women's rights yeah. conference. Yeah, um, right. So it's so there's a few things that are kind of one of the in terms of the conference itself, there are a lot of people who just boycott. I mean, not, they don't even. It's, I wouldn't even bother. To call, I'm not sure they bother to call it boycott. Like the socialist feminists organized a totally different conference in in Dayton, in fact. Um, they were here in Ohio. Um, at basically the same, like right in the middle of the conference. They're like, yeah, we're not going. We're going. We're going to Dayton. <laughs> um, and so you know, I think for a lot of feminists, they just. <laughs> They just decided that this was a kind of establishmentarian thing and it wasn't really worth their time. And there was a whole critique, particularly from the kind of feminist left of, of that, of, of the UN and having this get too professionalized, whatever. Um, in Mexico City, so Mexico City, as, uh, as Stephanie Smith knows, is the host of, it, it's maybe the most significant host of exiles, um, dissidents from all over Latin America. And in 1975, there's a lot of authoritarian regimes to be had in Latin America. So the, one of the biggest groups besides Mexicans in Mexico City is Allende supporters from Chile. Mm -hmm. And the biggest, in fact, the, um, the thing that the sexual rights is always being posed against is supporting, as if one could either support, you know, housing rights for lesbians or support, you know, an end to political torture in Chile. Um, but then th they're constantly set in opposition. Um, I, Allende's widow and his, uh, so Isabel Allende, who many of you know probably is a novelist, um, his, his, uh, also his widow and his um, sister are in, uh, are in Mexico City. And when Hortensia Busi Allende gets up to speak, people line up to give her flower to give deliver her roses and it's just this you know it's this sense that this is this uh the the um socialist party in mexico tries to ban giving visas to the chilean delegation they actually succeed in banning one chilean reporter who reports for the national the sort of government sanctioned uh newspaper such as it is and um the the chilean delegation of course does end up coming but is constantly being subjected to these um calls for, you know, like critiques of human rights violations. At one point, the um, Alicia Romo Roman, who was the head of the Chilean delegation, said, invites, he says, send a delegation out of Chile, I'll show you this is all, these are all lies. They, of course, quickly retract that invitation. Um, there is this, sorry, this is a digression from what you asked about, but there is this kind of crazy part of this conversation that, that the current moment reminds me of, which is that there's this difficult thing of trying to figure out what's real and what's not, and everybody's constantly saying, you know, that's, you know, there's like, so the Israelis are saying the Palestinians are lying and the Chileans are saying that everybody is lying. Mm -hmm. And there's these Ukrainians who are hunger striking, but I'm not even sure they're actually Ukrainian or actually really hunger striking or who they are, but they're like, you know, so there's like all this stuff happening. And those protesters, these, uh, wait, let me go back. These, like, where are they? Did I lose? Nope, sorry. It's after Elizabeth Reed. Those, that, that's totally fake. Like, that's a whole, like, I mean, this is, as you can probably tell by this, like, kind of uh, sinister looking woman <laughs> overseeing this compass, you know, who's showing up this, like, plan your family sign. Um, so, the, uh, 
get back to human rights. There were all these demands for human rights issues. They, um, the, uh, so Shana Salami, for example, doesn't even come to Mexico City. And all of those people just sort of sit it out, um, which is, I think, you know, partly in protest, they don't think, consider it legitimate. There's this interesting, so the, uh, the East Berlin conference, uh, conference does end up happening. It's WIDF conference. There's one of the most interesting accounts of that is this one from Frances Doughty, who's a lesbian activist, US lesbian activist, who talks about going to Berlin and just being really excited to see what it's like, what this story is like there. And she's constantly trying to like connect with other, I mean, I think she's hoping to like connect with other lesbian and lesbian activists to try and build an international network. And, and I think she has an idea of connecting with women in the Eastern Bloc. And um, at, the, at the East Berlin Conference, they put everybody from the United States off in a hotel that's totally isolated from anybody else, and they can't talk to anybody. And everything is incredibly closely monitored. Like, it's, it's sort of the opposite of the NGO Tribune in that it's very closely policed. And there you also don't get any kind of human rights um, discussion. So there is human rights discussion at, at, in Mexico City. It's, it's just always set up in this zero-sum game with, in particular, with sexual rights, which is kind of interesting. But yeah. Join me, Jim is right this time, in thanking uh, Russell Wilcox.